the Joe Rogan experience. Because now half of Ukraine is, is effectively militarily backstopped by Russia. So they have to get Europe to pass these sanctions on Russia. But the issue is, is a lot of these uh, EU member states did not want to have to buy super expensive Western LNG. It would be ideal if you could simply harvest the endogenous gas supplies in Ukraine. Ukraine happens to sit on Europe's third largest unexploited natural gas resources or the, the, you know, the shale that can be converted. And so they, so Burisma was a tool to be able to, to supplement the Western LNG with an endogenous and at home Ukrainian alternative gas supply so that the sanctions could go through in Europe and so that Ukraine would not be reliant on Russia to have cheap natural gas. But this required NAFTA gas, the state owned uh, Ukrainian gas company, which George Soros has been locked in a power struggle with Putin to over privatization with for decades. And it, and Burisma was the largest of the private for profit uh, firms that had the rights, the gas rights for exploitation of Eastern Ukraine and the, uh, you know, the, the surrounding uh, Crimea offshore, offshore gas supplies. And so Burisma was, was seen as an instrument of statecraft by the U S state department to economically bankrupt Russia and to militarily shut down Russia's war machine as part of the larger play for NAFTA gas and to build up Ukraine's innate gas supplies, which were which were underexploited, in part because of a military tension over who actually controls that territory. That's why the Donbass is so important. That's why after the counter coup, the U.S. was sponsoring the. This is what the military aid impeach the military assistance impeachment of Trump was about in 2019. We weren't at war with Russia then, right? This is 2019. This is right. three years before the outbreak. Uh uh-uh. uh. We were sponsoring the military reconquest of that region because that's where the energy resources are. The population's mostly in the West. The resources are mostly in the East. It's the same same thing with with China and and uh, and, and, and Xinjiang in terms of that dichotomy. And so this is you know, when Hunter Biden said what, when he was asked what he was doing on Burisma and whether he felt shame about it, he said he was doing a patriotic duty for his country. Burisma was an instrument of statecraft for the State Department. What they were doing is, is they were they were building that up. That's why they had that's why they had funding from from U.S. aid. Again, the CIA funding conduit was was working with the Atlantic Council with seven CIA directors on its board. Hunter Biden's on the chairman's advisory board of the NDI. Hunter Biden's law firm even has this just broke four months ago. Hunter Biden's law firm actually had a. Uh, wrote a pitch to the U.S. State Department for how uh, for how Burisma uh, could serve as a you know as basically a vassal for U.S. State Department interests in the region. You had the uh, you had Bur- uh, Burisma's back channeling with uh, what was it the U.S. ambassador in Rome for on similar grounds in terms of the uh, the the Italy Greece supplies, but. What you have here is a private sector for-profit company. Many such cases, by the way, because not only was Hunter Biden on the board of Burisma as chairman's advisory board of the CIA's DNC cutout, but who else was on the board of uh, the board of directors right next to uh, right next to Hunter Biden? Kofer Black, Kofer Black, who spent 30 years in the CIA, won CIA Distinguished Medals Awards. You can read the Daily Beast article where Kofer Black is described as Mitt Romney's Sherpa to the intelligence community to get the CIA's blessing to back him against Barack Obama. What is this CIA luminary doing on the board of Burisma? What is Hunter Biden, who the CIA personally calls the Justice Department off investigating his funding sources and is on the chairman's advisory board of the CIA cut out. It's because just like we have done since the 1940s, it is a private, it is a dual use entity. It's a for, it's a for-profit standalone private sector firm, but it's also an instrument of statecraft because every dollar that Burisma generates is one less dollar that Gazprom generates. And so it's the, it's the best job in the world. If you can get it, it is, it's, it's, you get to keep all the profits, and you are getting the backing of the battering ram of the blob. And remember, we personally intervened. It was Joe Biden at the Council on Foreign Relations who bragged about 
about forcing, using the diplomatic carrots and sticks of the U.S. empire, that if Ukraine wanted their billion dollars in, in assistance, they had to fire the prosecutor who was investigating Burisma. Nobody, nobody in, 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 our, in our Congress, I think, is, is prepared. If, if there was a total declassification of all CIA and State Department cables and documents and meeting minutes and emails and communications, if, if you had, uh, for, for all intelligence work related to Burisma, the treasure map that would break open, I think, would, be an, would, would frankly be a diplomatic scandal because this gets to the larger play around the IMF and it's play to privatize NAFTA gas because there's something very nasty here, which is that we have been trying to get just like we put Russia through shock therapy when when we won the Cold War. And then it was the Harvard Endowment and uh, you know, the Soros you know, crew and the U.S. State Department who privatized trillions of dollars of state owned wealth by the Soviet Union so that they could become a capitalist society. But then the assets are held by Wall Street in London. This, is, this has been the play with Ukraine. They know the potential of the entire European energy market running through Ukraine if they can just get it up and running. So, they, so this grand Ukraine energy play has been to privatize NAFTA gas, the, the, the feeder that Burisma feeds into, so that you have Western stakeholders who make the money by capturing that, that market – have the uh, have the blob of the, the State Department, the CIA and the DOD impose enough pressure to carve Russia out of the market. Now you've got private sector stakeholders who are basically, you know, early stage equity holders in a totally protected because it's protected by the ba- the the bayonet of the, the Pentagon, the State Department and the IC to make sure that that the profits run through there so that Russia doesn't get it. So it's a great job if you can get it. Jesus Christ. And all this stuff that was on the laptop, the, what, what was the whole thing about 10% to the big guy? And what, so was, what, what evidence is there? Yeah, well, you know, the 10% to the big guy and in another text, you know, he, I think he had said, you know, to one of his family members that, you know, half the paycheck goes to... What you have here is 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 almost is almost a tale as old as time since 1948 in terms of this relationship between private sector profit and foreign policy. I mean, I call it foreign policy for personal profit, which is this idea that if you have a senior level job in blobcraft, in defense, diplomacy, or intelligence. You don't make your money as a W-2 employee of the U.S. government. So, for example, Mark Milley. You know, the, the CIA director only makes about a little over $200,000 a year. You make, I mean, more as a third-year corporate associate than the, than the Central Intelligence Agency director. That's, you get your money from serving the stakeholders afterwards. Like Mark Milley was, you know, Joint, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What's he doing now? You know, he's at he's at J.P. Morgan. You know, doing the macroeconomic forecasting. Uh, so you know, so that uh, they basically have the insider trading vision of the guy who's tapped into everyone at the Pentagon. So they know what markets are about to open up because where the Pentagon's about to exert its influence. They know whether to invest in natural gas in, you know, in companies in Germany or Ukraine because they have the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as uh, to, to make phone calls to the people in the Pentagon about what's going to happen to that country in six months. Look up. Look, you want to see a great example of this. Oh. Look up the Donilon brothers. Look up, look up, uh, t- look up Tom Donilon's BlackRock Investment Institute profile. Tom Donilon is the brother of Mike Donilon. Mike Donilon is the the closest advisor to Joe Biden and has been for forty years. Mike Donilon is, uh, you know, I think began working with Biden in nineteen eighty two. He's literally the what they call the inner kitchen cabinet of uh, of the West Wing of the White House now. That's a great that's a great job to have if you are Mike Donilon's brother, Tom Donilon, who's currently the chairman of the BlackRock Investment Institute. So while his brother is the closest advisor to the president of the United States, BlackRock, which has ten trillion dollars of assets under management and portfolio companies in every industry in every region on Earth. uh, Tom Donilon, in theory, only needs to make a phone call to his brother, Mike Donilon, to know exactly what to invest in in term because he knows what 
billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of expenditure of State Department and Pentagon and intelligence work is going to do to the industries in the legal? region. Yeah, this is basically like Pelosi tracker, but for like military intelligence. It's all legal. <sighs> Tom Donilon, again, what was Tom Donilon? Tom Donilon didn't start out as a banker. He was the national security advisor in charge of military intelligence and uh, and statecraft for the U.S. Empire. He was uh, he was at the State Department. He was he was in IC. He was at DOD. He went straight from the blob to to BlackRock's banker. Many such cases, as I mentioned, Mark Milley. Another one is Jared Cohen, if, you know, who uh, was the policy planning staff whiz kid at the State Department who introduced the CIA's. Uh, you know, the CIA effectively to using social media for regime change work. He was the, you know, he was the guy who was known as Condi's party starter uh, in to, for how, how Condoleezza Rice as secretary of state uh, could get, could get this, could, could stop running uh, regime change operations uh, out of U S embassies and consulates and, uh, and CIA station houses, they could simply use social media to organize these. And that's what resulted in the Arab Spring and the Facebook and Twitter revolutions that toppled Tunisia and Egypt. And then Jared Cohen then goes on to start Google Jigsaw, which is the, you know, which, which set in motion the entire world of AI censorship we now live under. What, he just left Google Jigsaw. What's he doing now? Well, he's, yeah, now he's at uh, Goldman Sachs and he's doing their geopolitical, uh, you know, forecasting for, for Goldman friggin Sachs. So blob to banker pipeline every time, it, you know, and this is how these people go from, you know, making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year to being able to live like the people who they used to have to answer to when they were in government. So they are using the assets of the American empire they're, they're adjusting U.S. foreign policy in a way that maximizes their own personal gain. They're not necessarily doing the calculus about, well, should we be spending all this money on you? If that's what the stakeholders want, and this is what Biden was doing, and, and this is what the 10% of the big guy thing comes back to. I mean, you just look at the, the overwhelming, just unbelievable scope of it. All. I mean, first, so first of all, Joe Biden was known as Mr. Foreign Policy in um uh, by the Council on Foreign Relations for 40 years. That is, he was the blob's inside guy. And the blob is the foreign policy establishment, which now has substantial control over our domestic politics. It's supposed to fa face outward to manage the American empire. But when homeland politics interfere with the empire's plans, they sick it against us. And so for 40 years, he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. For 15 of those years, he was either the chairman or the ranking member. So the top dog for oversight of the U.S., uh, of the U.S. State Department, so uh, so he's got these international connections. People are constantly pitching him for forty years. There's a great video. I think you can look it up if you ever seen Joe Biden bragging about um, you know being a being a prostitute for uh, for the for the biggest donor, and that when he when he turns when he turns forty, uh, he was told that what. At one meeting that uh, for the real big money, he should come back to them when he turns 40. Have you ever seen this? Uh, no. It's a great clip. If you, I think if you just look up uh, the word prostitute, on uh, Biden prostitute uh, on my ex account, you can, you can find this. But basically, the Biden Incorporated was, was running a foreign policy for per personal profit operation. I mean, here's a crazy example. Joe Biden, uh, I'm sorry, Hunter Biden, I believe was, oh yeah, this is great. Well, I'm not sure you should assume I'm not corrupt, but I'm thank you for that, though. The system does produce corruption, and in, in, I think implicit in the system is corruption, when in fact, whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even for a small state like Delaware, uh, you have to go to those people who have money, and they always want something. We were told that we politicians, as the young kids say, rip off the American public. I think the American public, in a way, rips off we politicians by forcing us to run the way they do. To raise $300,000 is no mean feat. And unless you happen to be some sort of anomaly, like myself, being a 29-year-old candidate and can attract some attention beyond your own state, it's very difficult to raise that money from a large group of people. I'm a 29-year-old oddball. The only reason I was able to raise the money is I was able to have a national constituency to run for office. Because I was 29, I'm like the token black or the token woman. I was the token young person. I went to the big guys for the money. 
I was ready to prostitute myself in the, man the manner in which I talk about it. But what happened was they said, come back when you're 40, son. And he's 80. <laughs>